everyone. I'm Raja Kushalnagar. And I don't care how you pronounce my last name, but I care how you spell my last name because my first language is written English. So I, I don't know how to say it and it doesn't matter to me how you say it, despite speech therapy and all that, that doesn't matter to me at all, but I care how you spell it. So today I'll be talking about my journey and first of all, I want to say that I'm thrilled to be invited to this World of Wonder series, and I'm excited to be presenting to all of you today. So we'll talk a bit about my journey and then a bit about my science and technology that I'm working on. So today I'll talk about, I'll start by talking about my background and my journey, and then I'll talk about my current research. Okay, so I'll talk about my background growing up. I was born deaf, and my parents didn't know uh, they didn't know how to support me, so they tried the speech therapy approach for me. But I, I can't hear anything anyway, so I had to rely on only lip reading and written English and writing. So what worked for me was going to a small school. I was in a very small school with about 10 or 15 peers in my classroom. So it was easy for me to follow the instructions and to follow what was going on in the classroom because it was such a small classroom. And my school really emphasized science and math. And then after I graduated, I wasn't sure exactly where to go, but I picked the University of California at Berkeley. And I found a small college I found another small college that I was interested in, but I decided not to go to it. So let me start by telling you about my time at UC Berkeley. So I mentioned that I grew up going to a very small school with about 10 students in a classroom, and I had the same teacher. So I developed specific strategies that worked for me in that small classroom. And then when I went to UC Berkeley, this is, of course, a very large college with huge classes. One of my classes had 1,000 students in it in an auditorium style classroom. So the strategies that I knew before didn't apply here. I also, uh, when I first tried an interpreter, I tried an oral interpreter, and then later I learned sign language, but that was much later. I didn't always have captions. So I lost a lot of information. I missed a lot of information. And in the first year, I got mostly A's, and then it turned down to mostly C's, and then got down to mostly D's. And I realized that this was just not working for me. So I moved to a small state college in Texas instead of UC Berkeley. So I pursued a physics degree at Angelo State University, which is in West Texas. And West Texas, of course, is very flat. Mostly cows and sheep. There are more cows and sheep than there are people. But again, the college was very small, so I was able to use the same strategies that I used in my classroom growing up. And I didn't have support services or access services. But the strategies that I knew before worked for me. So I was able to get back to getting good grades, and I was able to graduate with my degree in applied physics. After graduation, I was ready to look for a job, of course, and I was not able to find a job in physics. So at that time, most of the physics jobs that were available were in the Department of Defense, which wasn't an option for me. So I wasn't able to find a job in physics, but I was able to find a job as a data analyst uh, working in an insurance company, and I enjoyed it. I didn't have the right training for it. I didn't have the right background to be a data analyst um, and to do programming. So what I did was decide to pursue a master's and go back to school at RIT. So I knew uh, at that time at RIT, I started learning sign language, and I started um, wanting to be more involved with the deaf community, too, at that time in my life. So, of course, you know that RIT has support from the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. So I took master's courses at RIT in the College of Computing, the Galasano College of Computing and Information Sciences. And again, most of the classes were fairly small. I had interpreters and I was able to work well with the professors. 
The one problem was that most of my classes were in the evenings, so it was hard to find good interpreters, and I often had to work with student interpreters. But regardless of that, the professors were good at supporting me, and I was able to get good grades. Before I graduated, I used my deaf network to submit my resume to a number of different companies and asked some of my friends who I knew who worked at those companies to forward them to the hiring managers. So at that time, AG Bell Labs in Chicago had several deaf people working there. So I submitted my resume to some of them and they forwarded it to their hiring managers. And one group did interview me before I graduated. Fortunately, I was able to get the job working in Bell Labs. It was good pay. You know, I had a nice house. I had a great support system. And my work specifically was as a software developer. So I developed software for phone and internet. And this is the old telephone and internet. It's not mobile phones like today. But back then, these were wired phones and some wireless phones, but more like a TTY. Uh, and I'll explain the importance of that later. But this was my first job. And it was at an institute that had 10,000 people um, across, several different camp uh, across several different buildings in the campus. So I worked with about 30 people in my group under my manager. And all of them were hearing, of course. I was the only deaf person. But I did have support from other deaf people. We would all meet on Tuesdays for lunch to talk about if we had any problems that came up. We shared how to solve those problems. Uh, we talked about any issues we had with our colleagues or managers. We talked about opportunities that might be available in the company. And we networked with each other. And sometimes we were able to refer each other to get other support from other places. So it was nice to have that system and network of support and to not be the only deaf person in the company. So the technology at the time was changing from the older phones to the wireless phones. And because of that, Bell Labs ended up uh, shutting down within three years of the invention and spread of wireless phones. They shut down around the year 2000. They went out of business. They did not forecast well the change in technology. So I, um, I predicted that the company would not be doing well, and so I started looking for other jobs before the labs went under. So I was hired as the information security officer at Gallaudet, and it was wonderful working at Gallaudet. Over time, there were some political things that came up and some managerial things that came up, and that wasn't necessarily my interest. My interest has always really been on research, and I was starting to realize that at that time. So I decided to step down from this position and pursue a PhD in computer science. So I moved uh, to Texas because Texas provides free education for deaf and blind people at all of their colleges and universities in Texas. So I went to the University of Houston and the University of Texas at Houston. Uh, those are both state schools. UTH has a medical school. And then I also went to the University of Houston. So both colleges are very close to each other. And it's just a bit funny the way that states work and the way that they name their colleges. Anyway, so I started pursuing my PhD at the University of Houston. and. I had to take several classes uh, to develop fundamental knowledge in computer science more broadly. And then after that, I had to take the comps, the comprehensive exams, to prove that I knew enough about computer science to prove that I was ready to start pursuing research. So from 2003 to 2005, I took classes and then I passed my comps. And after that, I was ready to start researching and focusing on my dissertation. For my dissertation, I had to pick something to focus on a topic, and I decided to choose medical imaging. And I worked, I was pursuing my PhD at the University of Houston, but I was working on medical imaging from the University of Texas at Houston. So I did also have some interpreter support, um, but not always. So that was sometimes frustrating to try to get the right support that I needed and get the access services that I needed. 
So at that time, I also decided to pursue legal school, and I'll talk about that more in the next slide. But I stepped down from medical imaging. I stopped pursuing that, that topic and moved into accessible technology. I worked with uh, the University of Washington in collaboration with the University of Houston to pursue my PhD in accessible technology and to do uh, research on accessible technology. And I'll explain more about my research on accessible technology in the next set of slides that I have. Because of the frustrations that I had with access services between the University of Houston and University of Texas at Houston, I decided to go to law school. Again, it was free for me as a deaf person in Texas, so I thought, why not? I thought it would be fun to take classes and learn more about the legal system. So I got my law degree, my Juris Doctorate, and then I also got my master's degree in law, specifically specializing in intellectual property. And I had to decide if I wanted to become a lawyer or if I wanted to become a computer scientist and which direction I wanted to take. So I decided to do both. <laughs> No, I decided to focus on research in computer science, but I also wanted to pursue my, my passion in science. So I still focus on policies in computer science, um, and sometimes I look back and wonder, but I'm very happy with my research career. So I started teaching at RIT NTAD after I graduated with my PhD. Um, I was teaching both associates and bachelor's degree programs, and I was also doing research. Uh, my research went well, it was well supported. And then I decided to move to Gallaudet for several reasons. Uh, my wife and I both uh, received job offers around the same time. And we call it a, a two body school problem where we both needed to find a job and we both needed to find a job in the same town. So uh, I decided to move to Gallaudet with my wife. Um, and I'm also able to continue my research on access, uh, access technology at Gallaudet. So I started by researching mentoring support uh, and growing the number of deaf and hard of hearing students who are pursuing computer science degrees. And then I expanded to summer research at RIT and then now at Gallaudet as well. And on average, we have about 10 or 15 students every year who do full-time research with us during the summer. And as a result of that, from the 90s to the 2000s, there were maybe one or two deaf people with PhDs a year. Very, very small number of deaf people who had PhDs. But now since 2010, we've had at least 10 students with PhDs who have entered the field. Uh, we have four in RIT already currently um, and several more at Gallaudet and other places. So we've seen a huge change from 20 years ago and a significant increase in the number of deaf and hard of hearing students in computer sciences. And we think that the uh, the inclusion of deaf and hard of hearing students in summer research programs has led to the increase of deaf and hard of hearing students pursuing computer science programs, both at RIT and Gallaudet. It's also important that students have role models and that they see what deaf people can do with their future and that they know about the research opportunities and development opportunities that are available to them. So now, we have so many uh, deaf people in computer science now. Uh, we've had to fight and support for language access on YouTube, for example. So 15, let's see, 10 or 15 years ago, about that, uh, there were very, very few captions on YouTube and automatic captioning was very poor quality. But now the quality of captions has increased over time and automatic speech recognition has gotten much better. And it's at the point now where information is fairly accessible, but communication is not yet fairly accessible. And I'll explain the difference between that and my next set of slides. Now I'll be talking more about my research specifically and the access to communication and information in general for deaf and hard of hearing people. 
and the difference between communication and information. So communication is two way and information, accessible information is typically one way. You receive information. So we included deaf and hard of hearing in one. We talk about so hard of hearing reception uh, with assistive listening and then deaf reception, may there be speech to sign or speech to text in captions. And then production or expression, be it text to speech through typing, sign to speech through an interpreter or speaking. There is a variety of diversity in communication and information and how it is accessed. So of all of the deaf and hard of hearing individuals that we included, 2% were, sen were senior citizens. And not including senior citizens, 2% were hard of hearing. Yes, yeah, so it was a very small number, then 0.5% were deaf. In a high school of 200 students, one might be deaf. And there might be a variety of resources available to them. because individuals, each individual has a different background from another person and they have a variety of approaches that are successful for them or that they prefer. When I went into law school, they thought I was hard of hearing because the person that they had provided access services to previously was hard of hearing. So they thought that everything that they used for that person would apply to me, and that was not the case. So the bottom line is you need to provide flexible options. Deaf and hard of hearing people need a variety of options, both in their social life and for their careers and in their place of employment. We sent a survey to several students in an internship program, asking them questions about their communication modes. One said that they never use their speech. Some said that they understand, people understand none of their words. A few were not confident in their speech. Uh, they might use speech only with their family, but not at work where communication or miscommunication could be a serious issue. We then talked about or asked them about how they communicate at work with their peers and colleagues. They could choose more than one answer. That's why the numbers may appear different, and there may be more in one category. Many said they speak for themselves. Many said that they use note-taking, writing back and forth, or texting. There is no one clear choice or one clear option that people use all the time. One option doesn't work for everyone. It may work for one or a few people, but not for everyone. Next was concerns about communication on the job. A number of people said that there were clear miscommunications and misunderstandings that happened. Many responded that they had trouble understanding what was being said. So what we see commonly across the board is there needs to be increased support for both expression and reception of communication, both spoken and auditory and uh, visual as well. Now discussing hard of hearing individuals and how, how they maybe mishear information. So are you wondering with ladle rat rotten hut? 
if you change the accent or how you speak just a little bit, it can confuse everything. This is an example of what hard, hard of hearing individuals deal with. So hard of hearing individual individuals often may have some auditory reception, but it might not match what they are reading on someone's uh, lips or what they might think that they're hearing. Receiving information through your ears auditorily or through your eyes visually, if you try to do this at the same time, if you think about converting auditory input into visual input and see what you can capture at the same time, there can be differences. There are, there is not an equivalent to what you hear exactly to what you see. So also, of course, there is a push or pull, you know, different people read at different paces and listen at different paces as well. The design principles, if you think about that and you think about a whisper, the further away you get from the person you're whispering to, the less they'll be able to hear you the volume will decrease the farther away they go. But now in sign, the farther away you go, you can still see to a certain distance, of course. We can sign across the street or from a different building if you have the visual field to be able to see each other. Now, when you're reading there, uh, often, of course, you're going, your eyes have to move from one location to another. If you use eye tracking, you can see where the eye gaze happens. And this will be an example of that. So you can see if we take the auditory input and turn it into a visual modality, we can see where the eyes follow as the person is reading. So if we think about a deaf person reading captions as they're trying to also watch what is happening on the screen, it's impossible to follow everything. Think about similarly with sign language if you're taking in that information visually, there can be some delays depending on where the person is trying to see. So you can see the difference in eye gaze between the two examples. Watching the person signing versus watching the captions, there's a difference in the eye gaze. Now I'm noticing more programs have a signing window. Uh, there was one conference that had the option to close the signer. That was actually a, a cool option. You can have captions and the uh, interpreter at the same time if you wanted. Other challenges that can happen are the visual noise, for example, or if it's too dark, or if something's blocking the view. 
often classrooms have, uh, you know, rows of students and the interpreters over here and the teachers at the other end of the classroom. It's hard to watch the interpreter and then watch the teacher or professor and what they're doing on the board, etc. It can be very difficult. Another problem is also the eye muscles. They're very passive. So you can see how the view changed between where the person was looking. Yes, takes a lot of work. You have to think carefully about how you can make it more easy to access, access both uh, modalities, both auditory and visual information, and make sure that that is able to happen. One example is I helped uh, Google make their apps more deaf friendly. I created, designed, disseminated everything. It's a, a pretty popular. And immediately when it starts, it shows the captions and then you can pause them to be able to read them. Also, it will let you know who's speaking. It will let you know if there is additional background noise that's interfering with the direct uh, main conversation that's happening. Ninety percent of caption users are not deaf. They may be individuals whose second language is English or maybe, you know, a variety of different individuals use captions. Some people listen to music and the captions at the same time, or like to listen to what is being said and read the captions at the same time. So captions make information more accessible to everyone, not just deaf and hard of hearing individuals. Now, talking about the captions themselves being available. So you'll notice here that there are a million videos here on YouTube, and only a very small number of them have captions. So it's a difficult problem. So now with automatic captioning, um, many more videos have captions, but one of the design challenges is that captions can be difficult to read, and sometimes there are just plain bad captions. I'll show an example of that in just a minute. So speech occurs at about 150 to 300 words per minute. And that translates to having about three to six words on each line of captioning, which means that they can only appear for a short time. Some people can read that fast, but some people cannot. And that results in missing information because they may miss captions. So let me show you this example. So you notice here there's not enough time to actually read the captions because they're popping on and off the screen so quickly and it's difficult to shift your eye gaze between both captions. Most of us don't read this quickly and so it's easy to get lost in this dialogue. So there are several different solutions. One of them is to increase the number of lines that are shown on the screen or to show captions on the side that scroll along with the audio. 
Another idea uh, that I'll discuss later involves highlighting and pausing the video or the captions. So here's one example where when the individual looks over, it slows down the time in the video. And so we can see that the eye gaze helps the person uh, identify what's going on and visually identify that information on the screen. So next I'll talk about how we can include deaf and hard of hearing students in science and computing research. So the goal here is that and what this quote means is that if everyone thinks the same, then the creations that they come up with and their ideas may not be the best that they could be. Instead, if there's a diverse team within the environment, they will come up with better ideas. It's the same idea with evolution and DNA. For example, you have to have diversity. And if a situation changes, then some people will not be able to adapt to it and others will be able to adapt to it but everyone will face different challenges and will be unable to adapt to certain challenges. So having diversity means that if a team runs into one challenge, they'll find a way around it, no matter what the challenge is, because they have a diverse team. So we support diversity in science, technology, engineering, and math. And this is where deaf and hard of hearing people being part of the team can improve design and user accessibility. Like I said before, 90% of captioning users are not deaf. So that's one great way that deaf people can contribute to user accessibility and improve user accessibility for everyone, not only deaf people. So institutional support, inclusion, all of that is important. And that's what the programs like RISE and Bridges are providing by including deaf and hard of hearing people in science and technology.